I know you're Scott Calvin. You know you're Scott Calvin. So let's make this simple. I say name, you say Scott Calvin. Name? Chris Kringle. Name? Santa Claus. Name? Père Noël. Babo Natale. Père's Nicole. Papa Gigio. Okay, Calvin. Maybe a couple hours in the tank will change your mind. Well, good morning, Hope. My name is Emily. I lead the children and students team here at Hope Ankeny. And wow, kids, thank you so much for how you reminded us of God's glory. Yay, way to go. Yeah. It's a great time to have the kids come and sing about God's glory because we're in this season of Advent. Uh, we're counting down to the celebration of our Savior's birth, Christ the Lord. More or less. I mean, more or less, that's what we're up to this season, right? I guess I'm not supposed to admit that from the stage of a church, but we all know this tension that we live in, right? Especially as people of faith, between the holiness of the incarnation and the jolly good fun of winter celebration, right? And that tension that we live in, we don't, we don't want to miss the incarnation, we also don't want to miss the fun. And uh, all of that tension, I think, kind of boils down and ends up resting on the back of one jolly old soul that most of us realize maybe too much seems to compete to be the center of the story with Jesus. You know who I'm talking about, right? Santa Claus. And, you know, we're still trying to get the word out about Jesus, but Santa Claus, it seems, people love him, like all over the world. In, in this movie, Santa Claus, Scott Calvin, he's magically being transformed into Santa Claus, and he gets arrested because, you know, he's in someone's house. So they want him to say what his name is, and he has so many options to choose from because there are so many different names for Santa Claus all around the world. Kids, do you know this? That in different places, Santa goes by different names? And there's even a lot of places where Santa doesn't come on Christmas Eve. He comes on a different day, which I think maybe explains a little bit about how he gets all those presents delivered to all those kids all around the world. Well, I encountered a version of Santa about 25 years ago that kind of stunned me. Uh, I, was, I had the privilege of being a Fulbright foreign language assistant. So I was living in this beautiful town of Villach, Austria. And while I was there, I encountered a version of Santa that was quite different. So first of all, in Austria, they don't call Santa Santa Claus. They actually call him Heiliger Nikolaus. And that means St. Nicholas. So they still call him St. Nicholas there. Um, you may or may not know this, kids, but Santa is the legacy of a Turkish bishop who was famous for being very kind to children. So they still call Santa St. Nicholas in Austria, and he doesn't come on Christmas Eve. He comes on St. Nicholas Day, which is December 6th. So in that little town of Philoch, all of this just happened. It's over for this year. It happened this week. And the thing is, well, I'm wondering, do any of you kids get a visit from St. Nick at this time of year? Is anybody going to see Santa or they saw Santa? Okay. Yeah, so you're a little bit like the kids in Philoch because they also expect a visit from Santa Claus. But, of course, St. Nicholas, he comes a little differently and he brings an entourage. And by that, I do not mean reindeer and elves. It's a little crazy. Take a look at what happens in Austria. I am Ralph Herzog, and I am the oldest Krampus here in town Altenmark. On the 5th of December, we came to the child's in their homes, and the good one gets some sweets from the Nicolo, and the bad ones get 
hit with the whip from the Krampus. Then we go from house to house for five, six hours. And after we visited all the children in Altenmark, there's a little run with all Krampus together. Yikes, right? St. Nicholas shows up with an entourage of furry demon creatures? Are you kidding me? It's the truth. Uh, each one of these has a name. They are called Krampus. So I know you usually come to church and you get to hear really fun, learn really fun like Greek and Hebrew words. But for today, I think you need to learn a German word. So repeat after me. Krampus. Krampus. That was very nice. It kind of hurts my ears when I hear Krampus. So just to make sure, one more time, Krampus. Krampus. Very good. So, okay, so my students, I was fortunate because they gave me a heads up that this terrifying thing was about to happen. They'd warned me that on the night of the Krampuslauf, which is the night before St. Nicholas Day, it's not called St. Nicholas Eve, it's called Krampusnacht, which is Krampus night, they have a Krampuslauf, a Krampus run, which is essentially a parade of Krampusa. It's led off by St. Nick, but then batch after batch of Krampusa come through. And they warn me to, to wear extra pants and um, to listen for the bells and be careful because what happens is, is pretty scary. It's pretty spooky. As the Krampus go through town, the crowds, I mean, thousands of families turn out for this, you guys. I know, you could never do this in Des Moines, but they do it all over Austria. Thousands of families turn out, they stand along the barricades, and they watch the Krampus go through. And sometimes the Krampus will actually snatch a naughty child out of the crowd and run away with it. Yeah. Don't worry, I, they've always given them back as far as I've seen. <laughs> but you have to be careful because they carry those switches. Those are real, they'll switch you. And they love to do things like steal your hat and, and mess up your hair. Like, it's kind of crazy. And so the first time when I heard about this and I saw this, I was like, this is bananas, guys. I don't know what you guys are thinking. And my students told me something that gave me some reassurance that all of Austria is not full of crazy people. What they told me is that yes, during the Krampus Lauf, everybody comes out and the Krampus, the Krampus taunt them and the switches do hurt. But when St. Nick gets to their house, mom and dad meet the entourage at the door. And mom and dad say, my children are all good. St. Nicholas may come inside. Krampus? You must stay outside. And the Krampus uh, wait outside. They get a little rowdy out there. They'll ring their bells and tap on the windows to try and scare the kids and make sure they know that there are Krampus nearby. But the kids don't have to worry because they're safe inside with their mom and dad while St. Nicholas gives them chocolate coins and gifts. And that gave me a lot of reassurance about this very strange Austrian tradition. But there's something that I think is interesting about it. I think it's interesting that the Austrians, they have this character that personifies everything that terrifies you. And they let it run wild in the streets with its switches and its bells because both the kids and the parents know the whole story. That even though it stings, ultimately, Krampus is not going to be let inside. That the kids are going to enjoy being showered with gifts from St. Nicholas, and Krampus will have to stay out in the cold. He does not have the power to get them. So besides it being fun to terrify all of you with Krampus at Christmas time, <laughs> we are reading through kind of a scary part of the Bible during Advent. This season, we've been reading through Revelation. And one of the things that I think Krampus and Revelation have in common is that they don't deny the reality 
that there are things that scare us. And they trot them out and make them larger than life so that we can face them down and understand that even though it smarts, they don't win in the end. Our hope is bigger than our fears. And I think that's really important for us, too. Now, a couple weeks ago, Pastor Ashley, she started out this whole series by teaching us about apocalyptic literature. She did a great job putting Revelation into context and pointing us away from the ditches that you can go into when you're reading ancient apocalyptic literature. And then last week, Pastor Scott, he did a great job pointing out to us, helping us understand how the numbers and the symbols of the book of Revelation actually point us to the phenomenal, full love of God, who is using that to draw us together into a boundary-breaking community. And both of those sermons are well worth your time. If you weren't here the last couple of weeks, hop out on YouTube and check them out. Because for us, Revelation is dense. It's not something that any of us could preach all of it in one sermon. It's kind of crazy to think that for the people that this was written for, they actually sat and listened to the whole letter in one sitting. But they understood what it was about. We have a lot to learn to figure it out. So one of the things that both Pastor Ashley and Pastor Scott shared about was this dualistic nature of apocalyptic literature, how there are these strong binaries of light and dark, good and bad, God and Satan. And the way that they are written about, it's almost like like a comic book. They're so exaggerated that when you read these stories, it's really obvious who's good and who's bad. And um, like I said, it's a lot like what you would see in like a comic book or on Kromposnacht, right? Where you see the all good character of St. Nicholas who's handing out chocolate coins and being generous and kind. And then you have the all bad Krampus who has nothing to offer but grief and switches. So with this duality, I want us to take a closer look. I want us to open Revelation and let the parts that maybe scare us a little bit run through the room for a minute. And, you know, avoid the switches and hold on to your children, but I think we're going to be okay. There are three sets of seven judgments in Revelation, and each one of those sets of judgment conclude with the final judgment which is the culmination of all creation. So in a sense, Revelation is kind of repetitive. So the first seven seals were broken, and as each one was broken, it released a fearful reality. Conquest, war, famine, death. And then it culminates in this vision that Pastor Scott preached about last weekend, where the great multitude come together to praise the one true God. And then the whole cycle starts over with this week's readings. This time, it's seven trumpets. So since we're talking about things that scare us, we gave your kids kazoos. (laughs) You got your kazoos, kids? Let's pull them out. Now, If you aren't familiar with how to get a sound out of a kazoo, you actually have to put your mouth on the big side, not the little side. And if you blow into it, nothing happens. The way you get a sound out is if you hum. So hum into your kazoo. See if you can get a noise. All right, hum really good. Get it right up in your nose. All right. Now the way that you play a song on a kazoo is your kazoo will play whatever song you hum into it. So, do you guys want to try jingle bells together? Okay, let's try jingle bells. One, two, three. How'd you do? All right. Okay, so you guys are ready now. You're going to play the role. Go ahead and stop until it's time, because you get to play the role of the angels. Okay, so here we go. There are seven angels angels that are about to blow their trumpets. And when they do, scary things happen. 
So are you ready for this? Okay, here we go. The first angel blew the trumpet. <laughs> Lovely. Everybody loves the sound of a good kazoo. The world was pelted with hail until it killed almost all the grass. And then the second angel blew their trumpet. <laughs> nice. This time, a mountain of fire crashed down into the sea. And then the third angel blew their trumpet. <laughs> nice. And all the water became poison. The fourth angel blew their trumpet. <laughs> and the sun, the moon, and the stars were dimmed, bringing darkness. Is this getting scary yet? Well, buckle up. There's a couple more angels. All right, the fifth angel blew their trumpet. And a plague of locusts came. And they weren't regular locusts. They had scorpion stingers. And they were chasing people around to try and sting them. And then, it's not over yet, the sixth trumpet blew. And it released a cavalry of 200 million. And their horses had the heads of lions. And they blew smoke and fire and sulfur. They were all poisonous that would hurt people. Whew. Man, this is actually some super scary stuff. And here we are just blowing our kazoos like it's no big deal. Well, let's, let's put our kazoos down for just a second. Because let's think about this. One of the ways that we kind of go sideways reading Revelation is when we hear these frightful, sometimes violent visions, and we start to think that they are literally going to happen someday. Remember how I said all of these visions, they are larger than life. They're exaggerations. Well, for the people that John wrote this letter to, these horrible images weren't some kind of awful future that lied ahead for them. These were exaggerations of fears they already were living through, things they were dealing with, locusts that would come and cause widespread hunger when they destroyed all the living things. Having your entire family wiped out because your well turned sour. That was a real fear for them. Having conquering empires sweep through the land and hurt lots of people, these weren't, these weren't things that they thought might happen. These were fears that were just exaggerations of what was already happening to these people. If Revelation were Krampusnacht, then these visions are the Krampusa, very real fearful things that are present threat. So if you're like me, you can be a little detached from this. I mean, I don't know about you, but my whole life, when I have turned on the tap, the water that came out was safe to drink. I don't really have an ongoing fear that my family is going to be wiped out by a sour well. And if I get a little scared of the dark, I flip on the lights and I make my husband go check the door locks, right? So what about, what if, what if these angels were blowing their trumpets for us today? What if they were showing us our biggest trials? How would that be? What are you afraid of? And when you think of those things that you fear, ask yourself, how many of them have already happened? Plenty. Plenty right? More than enough. Worldwide plague? Oh, I know the misery of that. Broken relationship with someone I love? Yeah, that's a sting I'm familiar with. A mental health crisis amongst young people. I didn't see that one coming, but I carry the weight of it every day. What about some scary economics, right? The worst inflation in 50 years? Check. Unaffordable housing 
and groceries. It's a reality for a lot of people. If you haven't been hungry this last year, count yourself incredibly fortunate because for most of the world, that is a daily fear. And you know what? I'm not, I'm not here to torture you with these. But I know what your fears are. So I can strap bells on them and give them switches and let them tor torment you. Because your fears are my fears too. They torment me too. I haven't been hungry this year, but you know what? It's still a weight that I bear, a fear that I have, that fear that makes you work harder, that makes you try more, that makes you go into debt. The trumpet blows and the doctor calls with the prognosis. The, another trumpet blows and there's been an accident. Another trumpet, another court ruling. Another trumpet, another trial, another tribulation. When we read Revelation and we try to figure out when is the tribulation coming so we can try to avoid it, we miss this reality that human life is an ongoing reality of tribulations. We can't escape it, not even at Advent with the bright lights and the ugly sweaters. So one of the reasons why I kind of respect the Austrians is because they acknowledge the fear and the darkness, even during the most wonderful time of the year. I mean, I don't know that my kid ever needs to be this comfortable standing next to a furry demon. I'm just saying. But you know what? All respect here, because I'm not sure how comfortable we let ourselves get with discomfort. I mean, you all have seen it at Jordan Creek Mall, right? Those kids that are bawling their eyes out in fear of this warm and friendly Santa Claus that you're trying to get a picture with? Can you imagine what would happen with our kids if we tried to plop them down to get a picture between St. Nicholas and Krampus? Oh, not a good plan. And right, and kids, you should know this, Krampus does not come to Iowa. You don't have to worry that your parents are going to do that because Krampus stays in Austria. But we prefer Santa Claus, don't we? He's all good. He's all jolly. None of you are rushing out to add a furry demon with a long tongue to your Christmas decor. Well, I mean, I actually have one, but my kids are probably a little weird because of it. And this is why, because my students in Filach, they looked forward to the Kromposlauf. They looked forward to it. They anticipated that evening when even though the switch is stung, they don't like that part. But they love getting out there in community and together, laughing in the face of what scares them, knowing that in the end, they are going to be cozy, receiving gifts from St. Nick, and Krampus is going to be locked outside. And I think it's kind of a shame, although I don't expect anyone to bring Krampus to their Christmas celebration, I think it's kind of a shame that we miss out on some of that. Because as much as I love the tinsel and the colored lights that bring light to this dark season, I really would love for every single one of us to have the satisfaction of looking our fears in the eye and laughing at them because we know that they don't last. And you know what? There is actually one American kid who is very good at looking his fears in the face. Kevin McAllister. Yeah. He had a lot to be afraid of, didn't he? And talk about larger than life. This whole movie is an exaggeration of everything, isn't it? I mean, we all know you can't leave an eight-year-old home alone for a week. We all know that if you drop an iron from the second floor and it lands on someone's head, it doesn't just leave a funny mark on their forehead. They're going to get hurt. And we also, I think most of us know, that the furnace in our basement is not a wide-mouthed monster trying to get us. They're all exaggerations. And yet... We also know the fears behind those exaggerations. As parents, that fear 
whether or not our kids are going to be able to handle life on their own. As homeowners, whether or not our security measures will measure up. As kids, and sometimes as big people too, wondering whether or not down in that dark basement there's something lurking that might get us, right? We all have these fears. We know what they are. But one of the cool things about this movie is that it's all this whole process of accepting and taming those fears. And that's what I want for all of us. I want all of us to be able to face our fears like Kevin McAllister faces the basement furnace. Do you remember that scene? Let's remind ourselves. Take a look. Our fears don't get smaller when we let them hide in the dark and run around in the shadows. And that's why we could skip all of the hard and scary parts of Revelation if we wanted to. I mean, they're not our story, right? These are the grief and hardship of seven churches in Asia Minor 2,000 years ago. On the other hand, what scares them is what scares us. That we will have to live through hard things. We don't get to skip to the victory. And like the believers in the seven churches, we live with fears that sometimes come true and sting us. So why hide from the truth? Like the kids in Philak with Krampus, it is so much easier to face our fears when we know that they are temporary. Which brings us to the seventh trumpet. So, you got your kazoos, kids? All right, here we go. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet. And St. Nicholas arrived with golden chocolate coins. I'm so sorry. I am actually throwing chocolate coins. I know, I gotta get over here too, don't I? Yes! Oh, I didn't get over here. Okay, here we go. Whoa! One more. Oh, one more. Here you go. Yes! Golden coins from St. Nicholas and not a Krampus in sight because they don't come to Iowa. Okay, that's not what happens in the Bible. <laughs> what happens when the seventh trumpet blows in the Bible? I guess we should read that too. The seventh angel blew his trumpet. There were loud voices shouting in heaven. The world has now become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he will reign forever and ever. Now that's the part of Revelation that we love, right? The vision of glory. After each series of tribulations, the promise is revealed again that this world will not go on as it has been. Jesus is coming to claim it forever, to make everything new, and to bring salvation to the believers. That's you, church. He's coming back for you. We don't have to pretend that our faith makes our life all peachy keen and perfect because we have a promise that we can cling to. When the trumpet blows and those things happen that make you doubt God's goodness and God's love for you, you can cling to this promise. And like the judgments and victory in Revelation, God's story of Advent also repeats itself. It circles back. We spend this season both in celebration and in anticipation. 
that the Jesus who came will come again. The prophet Isaiah foretold, nevertheless, that time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. The land of Zebulun and Naphtali will be humbled. But there will be a time in the future when Galilee of the Gentiles, which lies along the road that runs between the Jordan and the sea, will be filled with glory. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. The promise of Isaiah, God kept that promise into a dark and hurting world. He had the guts to be born as a little helpless baby. And by Jesus' life and death and resurrection, we receive the gift of faith, the assurance that God really does love us and that God will keep his promises. So we know that just as he kept the promise of Isaiah, he will keep the promise of Revelation, that Christ will come again and everything we fear and all of our tears will be wiped away. I hope this is a promise that you are receiving this Advent Because Santa is awesome. Have a blast with Santa. It's fine. But but what you get in Jesus is so much better because it lasts forever. He's coming again to claim you, to renew everything, to make all things new. When Jesus came the first time, it was proof that God loves us and he's going to come again in the fullness of his glory to make all things new. It's our promise. It's one we love to sing about and celebrate every Advent.